Hello and welcome to Distillations. I'm Michal Meyer, a historian of science and editor of Distillations magazine here at CHF. And I'm Bob Kenworthy, CHF's in-house chemist. This episode takes us inside the human brain and explores how we've understood gray matter throughout time. Old brains, new brains, the human mind, past and present. First, we'll go to Michigan's Upper Peninsula, where a cognitive scientist is exploring the connections between our minds, our emotions, and the technology we use. Then we'll talk to author Sam Keane about the history of neuroscience. Sam's new book is called The Tale of the Dueling Neurosurgeons, the history of the human brain as revealed by true stories of trauma, madness, and recovery. We're maybe a little more like the machine than we care to admit. And finally, we'll talk to neuroscientist Frances Jensen about a subject close to her heart, the adolescent brain. Frances's new book, The Teenage Brain, A Neuroscientist's Survival Guide to Raising Adolescents and Young Adults, explores new research about how and when the teenage brain develops. While I had research going on in my laboratory at work, I actually had quite the set of experiments going on at home. All coming up on Distillations. We might not think about the sounds our various technological devices make, but they surround us all the time. Think about the hum of your computer turning on, or the beeps your microwave makes when your food is ready. A cognitive scientist at Michigan Technological University is studying the ways we interpret these sounds and how they might affect our behavior. He thinks this knowledge can help create technology that can respond to human emotions. Reporter Allison Mills has the story. So this is luck. On luck. Michigan Tech has quite a few unique science labs. There's a metal foundry and an under-ice acoustic lab. But the Mind Music Machine, a collaborative lab between cognitive science and computer science, holds its own. Researchers here combine science and art with sound in a space that's like a recording booth mixed with a yoga studio and video arcade. I'm listening to chiming digital sounds made by one of the researchers. That is the digital jingle for a washing machine and dishwasher door, locking and unlocking. This is one of the, the familiar sounds you can hear from your everyday life. So we call this type of sound as ear cones, which is the uh, combination of ear plus eye cones. That's Ma Yung Hong Joon. Nickname is Philart, which means love art. Philart is a cognitive scientist here at Michigan Tech. Cognitive science is a relatively new, interdisciplinary field that takes bits of knowledge from fields like neuroscience, psychology, computer science, linguistics, and philosophy. Anything it needs to understand how the human mind works, how we think, learn, and remember. Philart researches how humans react to technology emotionally. Think of driving. Operating a car at high speeds, or in thick traffic, primes us for tension, even rage. Now imagine if your car and other machines could react to your emotions. It might look a bit like Spike Jones's futuristic film, Her, where an intelligent computer operating system begins to have feelings. Like, are these feelings even real? Or are they just programming? And that idea really hurts. And then I get angry at myself for even having pain. You feel real to me, Samantha. While we definitely haven't arrived at this kind of scenario, it is kind of Philart's goal. And to get there, he and other researchers are trying to teach machines how to better recognize and interpret our emotions. Here's an example. What if your car could sense your blood pressure, which is a physical marker of your stress level, and the stereo automatically switched to calm music each time another driver cut you off and your pressure climbed? Philart is actually designing a system like that. Whether we like it or not, we humans are increasingly engaging in relationships with our devices, and though we can't quite converse with them yet, there is something that sort of functions as a language between us. Sound. You've got mail. This is the, the sound that has functional uh, lyrics or speech part. That's Philart again, and that clip is what sound designers call a lyricon, 
as in lyric and icon put together. This is the example of lyricon that has non meaningful speech part. Boom, boom. Dum, dum. I have an old LG phone, and I actually use one of these lyricons as my alarm. Ding, ding, ding. Good morning. It starts off pretty calm. Ba, 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 ba. How? With that, I am guaranteed to fly out of bed. Philart says this reaction is exactly what software developers want. He explains how my panic jumpstarts my brain and gets my body out of bed. Our devices trigger our emotions, and we act in response. So where does one look to study these emotions? Where do they live within us? Philart says they're a part of what we might call our minds. Perhaps some of us use the word mind and brain interchangeably, but Philart says it's more complicated than that. He says our brains are a part of our minds, but so are our emotions, memories, senses, everything that helps us process the world around us. Until recently, most research on the mind focused exclusively on the brain. But why not just brain, right? So in cognitive psychology, the statement is, okay, people are thinking using their brain. But in embodied cognition, people are thinking using brain and their body. Embodied cognition is the relatively new theory that our bodies influence our minds. We think using our brains and our bodies. And this idea is key to Philart's work. While we might think of our brains as the central controls of our bodies, Philart says the brain isn't necessarily steering the ship all the time. The brain is more like a busy train station. All tracks pass through there, but the trains, my metaphor for our thoughts and sensations, are the vehicles that carry our processing thinking power. They can start and end anywhere, not just the train station. So our brains record and problem solve and keep tabs on everything, but our bodies are doing a lot to move along these trains of thought, so to speak. Traditionally, we really focused on cognitive processes, but now it's not that uh, simple, right? So we know, okay, we need to understand their affective processes or emotions and their body movement and behavior. We are the Mind Music Machine Lab. That's Stephen Landry, one of Phil Arts PhD students. He's showing me around the Mind Music Machine Lab, it's a large windowless room with black rigging holding up infrared sensing cameras around the ceiling. A whole wall is taken up by a grid of LCD screens, and neon lines flash across them as Steven steps up to a table. He picks up something that looks like a wrist guard with shiny pom-poms. These contain infrared reflectors, so the cameras pick them up and translate them into those neon flashes. We have people wear tracking markers on their body. They dance around. We get the XYZ location of all of their limbs and positions and all that other motion data. And then uh, we just basically make music out of that. That music you hear is created by computers, which are also using the infrared reflector wrist guards to capture and respond to the dancer's movement. That's Steven slowly walking across the floor. He raises an arm and the music goes up. He waves his arm around above his head, and... And if he moves across the room again, the reverb changes. When Steven swings his hand above his head, the display screen lights up with a swoosh of technicolor circles. Right now, what we're focusing on is basically, can we make sound off of movement data? And can we make pleasant sounding sound? Can we make sound that sounds like someone actually composed it? Both Steven and Phil Art want to better understand how emotion and art affect the mind. In art, basically, emotion is a huge uh, factor in it. So uh, you could paint a picture, make some song that makes you feel sad, makes you feel happy, that kind of stuff. The same can be said for movement. Our bodies can reveal our emotional states, either through tiny nonverbal cues like the twitch of a mouth or a faster heartbeat. It's the same thing with dancer gestures. Stephen and Phil Art want to see if they can pinpoint connections between how our bodies act and move and how we feel. So they're training the mind music machine to read human behavior. Subtle gestures are hard to read, so they're starting with dancers making exaggerated movements. So acting, miming out, it's all uh, uh, non-verbal communication. If a dancer is performing some gesture that she's trying to portray sadness or something in her gesture, can we detect that using the motion capture cameras? And then can we bias the music to make it sound sad, make it sound happy? Aesthetics and art and the perception of how something looks or feels 
is absolutely part of design. Here's another cognitive scientist. I'm Bruce Walker. I'm a professor at Georgia Tech, and I have a joint appointment in psychology and interactive computing. Bruce was PhD PhD advisor and runs a sound technology lab at Georgia Tech. Like Phil Art, Bruce is interested in better understanding how we use our senses, emotions, and brains to process the world around us, especially in regards to technology. When someone smiles with a big, broad smile, uh, we are very good at inferring that they're happy. With more practice, we get to determine whether that's a real smile or a fake smile. But there are more subtle kinds of cues that people use in their interactions with people that are harder to describe. Remember my alarm clock? Designers count on our emotional responses to technology. But while technological devices can inspire emotions in us, actually reading them and interpreting them correctly is still a challenge for machines. We're still a long ways off from the intelligent operating system in the film Her, who can detect minor variations in her owner's moods. And it's not just our devices struggling to pick up on these nuances. Some people have difficulty with subtle emotional cues too. The use of technology to to help essentially provide feedback and stimuli and feedback to uh, special populations, for example, children with autism, is showing a lot of promise. Cognitive scientists think sound and music could be useful tools for working with children on the autism spectrum. People with autism struggle with social interactions and communication. While a child with autism might know that losing his toy makes him feel sad, but he might not develop the concept of sadness as a abstract level, higher level, right? Cognitive scientists are developing techniques to help teach things like empathy to children on the autism spectrum. One method uses interactive robots programmed to say phrases with different emotional inflections. It's time to go. Which is different from sad. It's time to go. Which is different from angry. It's time to go. Researchers like Phil Art and Bruce Walker think music could also be a powerful tool to help kids connect these emotions in their minds by training their ears with music composed to communicate different emotions. It could be a starting place for kids to not only begin to understand sadness, happiness, and emotions, but also how to share these feelings with other people. For Distillations, I'm Allison Mills. We're going to step back in time now and hear from author Sam Keen about the early days of understanding the human brain. Sam's new book is called The Tale of the Dueling Neurosurgeons, the history of the human brain as revealed by true stories of trauma, madness, and recovery. Sam is also a frequent contributor to Distillations magazine. Sam, welcome to Distillations. Hello, thanks for having me. So, Why did you choose brains as a subject for a book, given that your first book was about the periodic table, which is about as far as you can get from brains? Mm -hmm. The immediate reason was I had been reading some stories about people who got injured in a specific part of their brain, and their behavior changed in a very unusual way after this happened. And I actually didn't believe the stories. I thought the author had made a mistake or something had to be wrong because it just seemed too unusual, too strange. There were stories about people, you know, who parents who couldn't recognize their children anymore or people who couldn't recognize any animals suddenly or they became incessant liars, things like that, just based on a brain injury. And it just seemed too odd to me to actually be true. So... I set out to kind of disprove those stories and then ended up proving myself wrong, but in the process found out a lot about how the brain worked, and I kind of thought, oh, wow, I bet you could, you know, write a whole history of the brain just based on different injuries and what it teaches you, and I really wanted something that would provide, um, you know, a really broad look at human beings, because when you're talking about the brain, you're talking about memory, emotion, language. Stories are really kind of built into the fundamentals of neuroscience. And I just realized it was a really rich and fun subject. And it seems to be only through tragedy do we find out what a normal brain works like. Yeah, unfortunately. um, Really until about a quarter century ago, neuroscientists 
worked in one way. They had to wait for tragedy to strike somebody, you know, uh, an accident, a rabies infection, a botched lobotomy, something like that. And then you see how the person's behavior changed afterward. And in most cases, these were just normal, everyday people like you, like me, where something happened to them, and all of a sudden they became this legendary uh, figure in neuroscience. You start off your book way, way back in the past with King Henry II of France, and this seems to be where the, the dueling first gets in between these two doctors. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? Yeah, the two doctors were Ambrose Paré and Andreas Vesalius, and they were considered the best neurosurgeons in Europe at the time. And this was the mid-1500s, so you don't think about neurosurgeons being around, practicing at the time, but there were people doing this kind of work, which is kind of amazing. Uh, the basic story was King Henry II was his big macho king, and he was having a jousting match one day, and he got clobbered in the face. And when the doctors looked at him, he didn't have any skull fractures. Uh, so they decided, well, he must be okay then. His brain must be okay beneath that. The reasoning at the time was that your head was kind of like an egg, where if the shell, your skull, wasn't cracked, then the yolk, the brain inside, must be okay. But Paré and Vesalius reasoned differently. They said, well, you know, sometimes we've seen cases where the skull looked okay, but the brain inside was injured very badly. And they diagnosed Henry with something which was very controversial at the time called a concussion. And it was really the first big concussion case in the history of neuroscience where you had someone following the symptoms very closely, providing a lot of detail about the case. And so over the next 10 days, uh, as Henry struggled to recover from this, you got to see a lot of foreshadowing of what was going to happen over the next few centuries of neuroscience. We're still dealing with some of these issues today. You hear about you know, football players, hockey players suffering concussions and then going right back out there on the field just because there's no obvious external injury when beneath, in a lot of cases, their brain might actually be hurt. So in some ways, we're still relearning these same lessons, even though they're four and a half centuries old. The way you describe it, we, we start off with concussion, we end with a concussion. So give us an arc of the evolution of how we understand the brain. What basically happened was after about the mid-1500s, they loosened up some of the strictures on being able to dissect bodies, things like that. So that became more common. They could look inside the brain. And what they basically started to do was to correlate injuries with symptoms. So they would say, okay, this person had an injury in this part of her brain. And after that, her memory went on the blink. And from that, they could basically make a map of the brain and figure out what each part of the brain did. One of the trends that I see in your book is this, this shift between localization and, and almost universalization, this idea that things are spread throughout the brain and the other idea that, oh no, these things are very specific to certain parts of the brain. And there seems to be a tension between these two, two movements. Yeah, there is definitely. You see this theme kind of come up over and over in neuroscience, whereas in the days of Vesalius, a lot of people, including Vesalius, it seems, it's a little unclear, but including Vesalius seem to think that the brain was just one big undifferentiated organ, kind of more like a lung or a liver, where you don't think about those having specialized parts. They thought the brain was kind of like this as well. And then we slowly started to move over to localization, and especially in the 1800s, that became the big idea. It was localization, localization over and over. And we're going to figure out what every single part of the brain did. And that we made a lot of progress that way. We really found out a lot about how the brain works. But 
in the past, you know, maybe few decades, past few decades, we've really come up against the limits of that approach. And we've realized that if we want to get into these big, big questions about consciousness, personal identity, even things like language and memory, we're starting to see we need to talk about lots of different parts of the brain working together. And so we're kind of moving back away from localization. It's not that we're rejecting localization and saying there's nothing to it. We know there's a lot to it. But to get on to these kind of a higher plane and look at these bigger issues, we do need to start figuring out how lots of parts work together. So we're kind of moving back toward what they were doing way back when. It's kind of fun to see the theme recycle itself like that. One of the other themes I noticed that, in some ways, I felt you almost trying to avoid it, the mind. You have the brain, you have the material part. How do you integrate that with ideas of consciousness, with the idea even perhaps of a soul. How did you navigate that very difficult terrain? It is difficult because you, A, we don't really know what's going on there yet, and it is controversial. There's a couple characters in the book. There's a famous neurosurgeon named Wilder Penfield, uh, Roger Sperry. Both of them had a lot of ideas about consciousness. They approached it in very different ways. Uh, Penfield was very religious, and so he thought that his work kind of gave... um, gave license to the idea that we have a soul in our brain. That's actually a very common theme throughout neuroscience history. You see a lot of people uh, designating that this must be the part of the brain where the soul is hiding. Sperry, on the other hand, had this idea that consciousness and the mind was what we call an emergent property. So you see something like wetness and water. If you have individual water molecules, they don't feel wet because it's just a molecule or two. You need a lot of them together to get this quality of wetness. And Sperry thought that the mind worked like that too, where if you have a few individual neurons, they're just cells. They're just kind of blinking on and off or doing something not very sophisticated. But when you have lots of them together, a mind emerges. A lot of your stories are really about, uh, you know, the blood and gut side of the brain because that was the only way to really study it. Mm -hmm. But over the last uh, several decades, we've had CAT scans, we've had MRI, we've had fMRI and things like that. So now we can actually see into the brain in non-invasive ways. What are the kind of things these technologies are showing us about the brain? Before, we had to wait till someone got injured and then we could study their brain. With these new tools we have, we can look at normal everyday people who have intact brains and see how their brains are working. They allow us to see thoughts, uh, you know, sort of thoughts. It's a little hard to say exactly what's going on sometimes, but thoughts, so to speak, in action. So especially with fMRI, we can see people making decisions. We can see people thinking through things. And some neuroscientists are a little skeptical of these very seductive, colorful pictures you see. So you do need to be careful interpreting these things. But we do get a sense of what's going on in real time, in some sense, inside the brain. I think this kind of technology is also raising new questions about things like free will, for example, Mm -hmm. because I recently saw a piece, I think, in the New York Times about how if you are studying the brain with some of this new technology, it's almost as if the decision appears in the brain on these scans before the person has actually made the decision themselves. Yeah, there's a famous series of studies that were done in the 1980s by uh, scientists in San Francisco who had people sit down and they would lie a hand flat on the table and all they had to do was move a finger at some point. Just whenever they wanted to, they could move a finger. And he was studying electrical activity in their brain and he was looking for different types of wave activity going on. There was a wave, a spike that signaled that a movement was going to happen. So the motor centers of their brain would start sending a signal down their arm to their finger and actually move the finger. And then there was another cycle of signals that was kind of alerting the conscious brain and saying, okay, I made this decision. So that's what quote unquote, the me that was making the decision. So again, there was the the motor part and then the me deciding to move it. And 
kind of unfortunately, you kept seeing the motor part would start before the me part would really make the decision. And it happened over and over and over where the motor part would start. And then a moment later, the me part would be like, oh, yeah, I, I meant to do that. Like I was trying to move that. But that doesn't, like, you look at the chronology and it doesn't quite make sense that the me part would come later. So what it seemed like was that it was sort of a post hoc way to rationalize it, that your me was saying, oh, you know, I meant to do that and I did do that. It was just sort of this feeling that you get after the fact. So Sam... What, one of the things that surprised me in the book is the critical role of emotion in reason. I think most of us live with the paradigm that in order to make a perfectly rational decision, you've got to take all the emotion out of it. Mm -hmm. And yet that doesn't seem to be true. One of the kind of the big themes of the, maybe the past three, four decades of neuroscience is we're really starting to see what role emotions do play in our reasoning. And the reason we think that emotions uh, are kind of the antithesis of reasoning is we've all either seen people or been in the case ourselves where we get very angry, very upset, and we're not thinking clearly, we're not making good decisions. But if you see people who have damage to the emotional parts of their brain, you start to see them make really irrational decisions. There was a case of a man in Iowa. He ended up divorcing his wife and marrying a prostitute. And what they've really found is that emotions help us reason in that they bias us towards one thing and away from another. And the way they do that is they make some things painful for us. The reason that we don't, you know, all invest our money in get-rich-quick schemes is that we think, but I could lose all my money, and that would hurt me. That would be painful. If you're not getting that pain, if you really don't care because there's no emotion, then you think, well, maybe I'll just gamble and see what happens. Maybe I'll win. You don't have that thing saying you're going to feel pain in the future. It, gets, uh, it goes right to that boundary of can we make a machine that is just as good as the human brain, mm -hmm. yeah. and a machine would not have emotion. A machine would not have emotion necessarily, but you could think about how to give a machine emotion. I'm someone who thinks that artificial intelligence probably will be able to produce something that's conscious, a machine that's conscious. I don't see any sort of hard distinction between a human brain and, you know, transistors or something that would prevent it from being conscious. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to get a human consciousness, which I think is what you're kind of going after. It's going to be consciousness of a different sort than the kind that human beings have because computers don't have a body and because even if you give them emotion, it's going to be a different kind of emotion than the emotions that we have. Well, evolution shaped our brains over millions of years. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about artificial intelligence, how would you, I mean, what would be the, the forces acting to, to shape that intelligence and shape its consciousness? At the beginning, especially, it would be what human beings are programming the intelligence to do. So there would be a human bias kind of built into that. And maybe, you know, you could never escape that. What you could imagine is the sort of turning the machine or the computer program loose and letting it decide what it wants to do. We're maybe a little more like the machine than we care to admit. Thank you, Sam, for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Our next guest, medical doctor and neuroscientist Francis Jensen, will bring us into the present and tell us how far we've come in our quest to understand just what is going on inside the brains of teenagers. Francis, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. You just recently wrote a book called The Teenage Brain. So what inspired you to write that book? My day job is one of being a neurologist and neuroscientist. In fact, I'm chair of a department now, but when I... I was experiencing being a parent of teenagers. I realized that while I had research going on in my laboratory at work, I actually had quite the set of experiments going on at home with my two sons um, who were entering their teen years and I was single parenting. And I was um, just uh, 
astonished at the paradoxical behavior coming out of these guys. And because probably more because I was a single parent, I wanted to try extra hard not to alienate them. And given the fact I was a neuroscientist, I thought, that's it. I have no idea why they did, just did what they just did. What were they thinking? Well, I'm going to go find out. And I found, as this was in the mid to late 2000s, you know, sort of 2005 to 2010, that there was a lot of new research that had just was only years old, two to three, four years old at the very most and mm -hmm. happening contemporaneously um, mm -hmm. and was opening up a whole new understanding of this rather neglected um, stage in human development. This teen brain hadn't really been uh, recognized as still a period of the brain being under construction. It became clearer and clearer that, you know, you're not just an adult with fewer miles on you after 12 years of age just because you've gone through puberty, um, you know, in your early teens, that you're really only probably 80% of the way there. The idea of a teenager doesn't seem to be have been around for that long. Can you give us just a bit of historical overview of how these years have been seen? I think Shakespeare uh, was one of the first to actually coin a word that sounded like teenager. It's only been in the last, I would say, you know, century that uh, adolescence has been um, recognized as a as a stage, and social psychologists realizing that they that adolescents clearly don't have the same behavioral patterns as as adults. But the biology behind it was not known. It, it was purely observational. And, and without really understanding the biology, you don't get a sense of, of really why it's happening and that it's a normal thing that's happening, that they're not just teenagers trying to be bad and, you know, errant and just trying to cause trouble. This is part of normal life of they're not able to really use, we'll get to this in a minute, their frontal lobes for their judgment um, the regions of their brain that, that are uh, subserving judgment, executive function, em empathy and insight and controlling impulsive behavior are not as fully developed. So they're, you know, this describes a teenager, right? Indeed, but how do you study that? I mean, yeah. you, can't, you can't take a part of brain and look at its component parts under a microscope. In the last two decades, we've been blessed with unbelievable insights from what we call advanced neuroimaging, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, functional magnetic resonance imaging, something called fMRI, where you can watch brain regions that are talking to each other light up, you know, on the image. So it, brain regions that um, fire together, wire together. And we're able to now construct wiring diagrams using diffusion tensor Im imaging. It's called DTI. Mm -hmm. um, to we're now able to build what we call a connectome of the brain, which is a brand new field, a, a phrase that got coined probably a decade or so ago. And that brilliant new um, advanced imaging is being used to investigate human brains in a way that we've never been able to see a human brain functioning before. Uh, so a lot of information around the, about the growth trajectory of the brain and regions that are or are not functioning in an adult-like manner comes from that kind of, uh, you know, neuroimaging on humans. And I think probably um, some of the most beautiful work uh, in this uh, was done by um, Jay Geed and another author, last name is Gottgay, who with a large NIH um, funding program uh, – has been doing serial functioning, functional imaging of, of people from uh, infancy, essentially, early childhood, all the way up through their 20s. And it's still going on. And the revelation was that uh, brain regions uh, that wire together, fire together, and that that process took time for the whole brain to get connected to itself, and that it was going from the back of the brain to the front. And of course, it's not until your early 20s that you actually finally fully connect up to the front of your brain, even though it's still there. It's just when I say connected, I mean with um, fiber tracks that conduct electrical signals very quickly in a way that adults do. Hence, decision-making can be a challenge for teenagers, and especially decision-making that requires like in the moment, fast transmission, like on the spot, is this a good thing to do? Cause, effect, cause, effect. Um, teenagers are not going to link it the way adults do. It's been shown for 
decades that their risk-taking behavior is much higher because of this. They just don't think about the consequence. So that is a big piece. But the other thing that we've learned from a combination of the human studies and the animal studies, brain cells, in order to um, develop, have to be active. And in order to make connections, synapses, we call them synapses, um, you have to have activation. So the more you learn, the, the stronger you're making your synapses in whatever pathway you're using to learn a task. And the process for doing that is actually the best during childhood in something we call a critical period of development. And the critical period of development means that's that time when you can learn multiple languages, you can become a, you know, violinist, you can, you know, child prodigies appear because they can, they have an amazing ability to learn um, at a much faster rate than adults. And it's because the proteins and the processes that are required and the number of synapses that you have in childhood is much higher than later in life. So the adolescents too have a much greater facility, not as good as, the as a child, but certainly better than their parents um, for memorizing things and developing synapses in, in, a, in, in an experiential way. The part about the synapses and teenagers is, uh, is a good news, bad news story in a sense, mm -hmm. and something I think is really important um, for the public to understand. Uh, the, the teenage brain is still coming out of this critical period. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity for resilience. Um, and that's a message where I think previously to knowing this, uh, we kind of thought, brain's sort of done. You are who you are by 12, 13, 14. You know, you're, you're a student. You're not a student. You're a juvenile delinquent, not a juvenile delinquent. You kind of die as cast. And that is so not true. Let's Let's pick one of the biggest labels that we think about, which is your IQ, um, which I think we all thought was something sort of an innate property of my, each individual. They had their number sort of like stamped on their forehead, right? Well, it turns out that it's not a fixed number. Between 13 and 17, studies using advanced imaging and I, paired with IQ testing showed that actually, yes, a third of people stay basically in the same range during that window. But a third of people actually go up significantly, statistically significantly, and then a third go down. So my response to that, if your IQ goes up, that's great. But then if the IQ goes down, it's like, that's terrible. Why is that happening? One a notable um, set of studies, which I think is very relevant today and today's world, is that cannabis, chronic daily pot smoking, actually is indeed one of those things that can drop your IQ. Cannabinoid compounds function at synapses. And a lot of um, the book, I talk about what makes a synapse work, what makes a synapse not work, what makes um, what we call plasticity, synaptic plasticity, which is how a synapse is plastic. It, it grows in response to learning. Nicotine, cannabis, illicit drugs, no surprise, a, a lot of the substances of abuse actually dampen down the brain's ability to do synaptic plasticity. And so the process just can't get started. So you can't learn and be drunk at the same time, right? Right. Similarly, when cannabis is in your system, actually, and the, the teenager actually has a heightened response to cannabis, it impairs this plasticity. We call it long-term potentiation, which is Potentiation meaning strengthening, long-term meaning for a very long time. That's kind of what learning a memory is thought to be. Um, it turns out cannabis blocks learning a memory. It blocks synaptic potentiation because it's actually acting to turn off synapses at the same time your learning is trying to turn them on. If you're building a brain, you're not just learning something for the moment. Let's remember that the teenager is still building their brain. So when they're building synapses, it's not only just to learn that arithmetic problem or that random fact. It's part of building the cytoarchitecture of their brain. So if you have something like cannabis turning your brain cells off and turning this process of synaptic growth off chronically, your brain is not gonna grow where it should have grown. So in, in one sense, you could say they're squandering an opportunity if, if they uh, abuse. I'm trying to not use negative terms, mm -hmm. you know. I want to say maybe you have one brain, mind your brain, 
you know, research has definitely shown us that our brain cells don't multiply in most areas of the brain. Certain areas they do, but not very much. Not enough to make up for big mistakes in this window. So that you want to mind your brain um, because you are building it for the rest of your life. The, the teen brain is much more vulnerable to the effects of drugs. Again, once again, we see the adult doesn't learn as well, but the adult doesn't affect, doesn't actually get the effects, the negative effects either. One important parallel, if we're talking about drug use and abuse, is the phenomenon of addiction. Yeah. Now, addiction is actually a form of synaptic plasticity as well. Yeah. It's not happening in your fact learning center. It's happening in your reward system. Mm. So when we learn, we learn by synaptic plasticity, growing a synapse. So you, you repeated exposure to information causes that repeated activation of a certain pathway, which then causes these proteins to come up into the synapse and build a stronger synapse so that thereafter that synapse is much more efficient. And that's memorization, right? Or learning a task. Now let's just think. So that's repeated exposure to something that gets a stronger response. Let's now move over to addiction in our right. minds. We have repeated exposure, not to facts, but to drugs. Not in your hippocampus, which is your, you know, remembering trying to tag facts. This is now in your reward system, in your amygdala, nucleus accumbens, and a place called VTA in your brain, which are associated with habit forming, you know, addiction, reward. Uh, circuits. So again, you repeatedly expose. Now the teen brain responds even more robustly because it is a form of synaptic plasticity. So it's just like the teen brain can build a, a longer, stronger, harder synapse, it does it for addiction as well. So they actually get addicted harder, longer, stronger than the adult, just like they learn harder, longer, stronger than the adult. A real world example of uh, teenagers getting into trouble because of their brains. It seems to me that, um, particularly in, in Europe and in Britain and even the United States, there have been cases of teenagers, some of them are converts, some of them were born Muslim, who have mm -hmm. been seduced, perhaps, let's say, by what is called the Islamic State to go mm -hmm. and do terrible things. The current situation with ISIS is sort of the perfect storm. It's a strong emotional um, you know, kind of stance that they take uh, that is preying upon people who probably are feeling like they're misfits wherever they are in, you know, their communities. They are lured, you know, as a very attractive kind of sounding, you can belong to our group. You might not belong, you know, you may be a misfit where you are, but you belong with us. So there's that whole peer pressure thing happening. And of course, these are very impressionable brains. And at the same time, they don't have their frontal lobes to say, you know, this may not be a very good idea. Um, and yet they're zealous, you know, they, they are, that synaptic plasticity makes them zealous. You know, and so they're the perfect victim for ISIS. I don't do a lot of tips in this book at all. I'm not trying to, you know, be prescriptive. But I do say that it, you know, stay close to your teenager. Don't be a hover, you know, a helicopter parent. But, but stay close, stay connected. You know, your teenager two months ago is a different teenager than the one you've got now. And right. they're changing so rapidly. But you just want to make sure it's sort of making sense, mental illness comes on in this window. What happens is as the brain develops, actually it develops into a stage where your brain is capable of finally manifesting depression or schizophrenia, for instance. Francis, thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you very much for all of your really thoughtful questions. And it's so nice to have an opportunity to sort of bring this to light. So thank you very much. For Distillations, I'm Mikhail Meyer. And I'm Bob Kenworthy. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening. listening.